everyone, welcome to Tuba Tunes. I'm Luke and in today's video we're going to be doing a spoiler review of Happy Halloween Scooby-Doo. So I did previously do a non-spoiler review on this channel, so if that's the sort of thing you were looking for, if you wanted to see whether or not to check this film out, I'd go recommend that one because this one is going to be talking some major spoilers. Now in that non-spoiler review, I did give my overall opinion on the film. I did sort of break down the film's synopsis and I discussed different elements such as Elvira and Bill Nye's guest star appearances. So if you do want to hear me talk about that, like I said, go check that one out. But this is just going to be a spoilery deep dive discussing a lot of the revelations that came out of the film. As I mentioned in the last review, I did previously do a trailer breakdown for the film film where we took a look at the trailer and I theorised what I thought was going to happen and like I said in the non-spoiler review I wasn't really able to discuss whether my like predictions had come to pass because a lot of those things were spoilers. So we're going to be taking a look at some of the theories that I had in that video and we're just sort of going to see what came to pass. Okay so one of the main things I talked about was the inclusion of the Scarecrow and like I said the inclusion of him in the trailer and, the, and them showing him being unmasked obviously meant that that case would sort of be wrapped up early on in the film and we were correct about that. That probably was all wrapped up within the first five or six minutes of the movie. But of course with it being Scarecrow, such a large DC Comics character, I felt like he was going to have a presence on the rest of the film and I theorised that the pumpkins coming to life may possibly be due to his fear gas and the gang are just hallucinating the pumpkin. Well we were half right because his inclusion did of course lead to a larger involvement later on in the film. He wasn't gone in the first six minutes, he definitely returned. But it wasn't due to his fear gas. Now that was a theory of both Velma and Bill Nye in the film because when Velma asks, Bill Nye debunks it saying that was the first thing he checked for and of course it wasn't. No, these pumpkins were f actual physical things chasing the gang. I was talking about how I like to see the fear gas being used because I feel like it's a good excuse to like do something really super creepy and paranormal without having to come up with some sort of explanation on how like the pumpkins were actually real. Well, they did come up with some sort of complicated <laughs> explanation, but it wasn't too super complicated. It was essentially just the pumpkins were carved fairly normally and had lightweight, super strong drones in them that were carrying them about. And I do think the drone technology was like a fun modern twist to a Scooby villain. Like I did talk about how like the fear gas would let them do something like truly like supernatural feeling that you wouldn't be able to come up with an explanation for and obviously it turned out in usual Scooby fashion like some of the things the pumpkins actually did probably wouldn't be possible if they were piloted by drones but it's Scooby Doo and you just sort of suspend your disbelief and like they do a few things that maybe they shouldn't be doing, but it's fine, it's fun. But I would still like to see the gang come across the Scarecrow again at some point and maybe involve the fear gas in some way. In the end, I do think it was good that it wasn't the fear gas because the fear gas was sort of used slightly earlier in the film as being almost released. And I do think it would have been too obvious if that was the explanation they gave later on in the film because it had sort of been set up but like very obviously set up so it turns out that actual setup wasn't set up it was more of a red herring but speaking of the scarecrow let's talk about when he does return in the film and he returns in the end to help the gang because it turns out that he was actually set up sure he wasn't framed because he was behind the crime at the start of the film however his being there and mystery Inc. finding certain clues had all been like set up by a larger presence and it turns out that this person was also the person behind the pumpkins and was behind some larger goings on in Crystal Cove. I do think it was interesting to see the Scarecrow as an ally. I do think they were able to use his technology and his power set incredibly well at helping the gang. Just exactly who was this villain that had it out for both the Scarecrow and the gang? Well it turns out it had been the Sheriff all along. Now this was the same Sheriff that we had previously seen in the last two director video movies, Scooby-Doo Curse of the 13th Ghost and Scooby-Doo Return to Zombie Island, where his appearances in those films kind of slightly set up what was going to happen in this film, but not to any great extent. If anybody hadn't seen the reveal at the end coming, I wouldn't feel too bad because even though it was clear there was something fishy about this particular sheriff, they never gave us any outright clues as to his motive. You now the last two films definitely set up the idea that him and the gang don't necessarily see eye to eye. And I do feel like Curse of the 13th Ghost with him banning them from solving mysteries, I do think that sort of helped set up the idea 
that he wouldn't want them looking into things while he's got his own plot going on. I think it does set up the idea of he, he doesn't want the gang there looking into things while he's got his own nefarious scheme going on. But then of course at the end of Return to Zombie Island he does let them return to mystery solving which seems to go against his plan. And perhaps that's why at the start of this film he masterminds the whole scarecrow mystery to keep the gang distracted. But of course the gang being who they are they wrap the mystery up in no time. And so just as his evil scheme is about to commence the gang are actually free to dedicate all of their attention solely to the pumpkin. So it does seem there there's sort of a weird back and forth in his plans which I do think is definitely sort of something that threw us off because at the end of the last film and even at the start of this film he didn't seem to be outright against the gang. Whereas if his actions were similar to how he was in The Curse of the 13th Ghost at the start of Return to Zombie Island maybe we would have been a little bit more suspicious. I will also say that I didn't immediately recognise him as the same sheriff from the last two films at first glance simply due to the fact that in the last two films he was wearing the blue sheriff shirt whereas in this film he was wearing the sand coloured sheriff shirt which I know isn't huge like it's the same design and it was the same voice actor and I did eventually realise it was the same character but I do think when it's a character you aren't fully familiar with like a fairly new one like this a, a drastic change in this colour scheme is going to throw viewers off and so they don't necessarily immediately recognise him as being the same person. After all, over the year, the gang have met many sheriffs, and most of the time they aren't the same person. So it wouldn't be that crazy of a leap to think that this is just a completely new sheriff because they're in a new film now. I'm not entirely sure why they changed the colour of his shirt, and it's possibly due to the fact that the Crystal Cove sheriff that we are most familiar with traditionally wears a sand-coloured shirt. One minor gripe with the sheriff being the big bad of this whole film is when they revealed his motive and they shown us some of the flashbacks, it was to a case that we'd never really seen or even heard of before. The trash monster of Scranton case was quickly name dropped at the start of the film but we weren't really given any information on it. I don't feel like it was really there to help us work anything out. It just seems odd that they did go out of the way to include the character in the two previous films to sort of help set up this arc when really his appearances in those films don't set much up and the main piece of his backstory is all something that happened off screen. Of course it's not a new thing that an a movie or an episode of Scooby-Doo doesn't really give us clues where we can actually work everything out. A lot of the time the person under the mask can be someone the gang have never met before or even had reference to earlier in the episode. But it does seem odd that the teams behind these films went out of their way to set this character up and still the most important piece of the backstory was still something that we learned new retroactively in this film. You know, because I do think it is just a slight shame because at first when they revealed it was him and then they showed all the flashbacks to the previous two movies, it was like, oh yeah, they've been setting this up all along. How did I not see it coming? And then they just carry on doing flashbacks and it's the stuff we've never seen before. And then it just sort of seemed to lose its weight almost. Also when they do mention the trash monster of Scranton earlier in the film it's the sheriff that mentions it and he said it's the first time them and the gang met but then later in the film they do reveal that he was the trash monster of Scranton. Well as a viewer we aren't aware that he wasn't the sheriff during the trash monster of Scranton but of course the gang are and they don't bat an eyelid to that because from the backstory they gave us we're meant to believe that they caught the trash monster of Scranton and he served his entire sentence in prison before he came to town and posed as a sheriff. Now of course I feel like this is something that was an integral clue for the gang and it's something they should have picked up on because they mentioned multiple times in this film that they hadn't had a large number of interactions and he hadn't been the sheriff for a very long time. So surely one of the gang members, probably Velma, should have clocked that they hadn't actually met the sheriff back when they unmasked the trash monster of Scranton. But I don't think it was necessarily a great clue for the audience because we weren't aware of the timeline of all that happening. I mean it was the first time the trash monster of Scranton was referenced. Maybe if they'd referenced it into the previous films as well it might have held more weight but that reference at the start of the film on its own wasn't really a clue for the audience but I do feel like it sort of was meant to be for Velma. Because of course at the end of the film Velma does figure out that it is the sheriff that's behind it but she hadn't in fact figured out that the sheriff was actually Cutler Toe aka the trash monster of Scranton. Now in regards to the sheriff is this the end of his story? We do see that the, at the end that he does escape law enforcement but only to be captured by the scarecrow. 
Now will we ever see him return? Will we ever see what the Scarecrow does to him? I mean, it's most likely that the Scarecrow kills him. You know, but this is Scooby-Doo, it's the PG world, so maybe not, and maybe we will see him return at some point, because it does definitely seem that the gang has a grudge to settle there, because they never really captured him. I do see a lot of people online saying that this is the end of a trilogy, although I do definitely think the thread could be picked up at some point. It might not be the next film. I do know the next film is meant to be Scooby-Doo in King Arthur's Court, so I'm not entirely sure whether he's gonna show up there. Okay so quick disclaimer I actually filmed this video a couple of weeks back now when I still had all the Halloween decorations up but just in the last few days a bit more information has leaked about the Scooby-Doo in King Arthur's Court movie. So it's not actually gonna be called Scooby-Doo in King Arthur's Court it's gonna be called Scooby-Doo the Sword and the Scoop. This is another film that's gonna be written and directed by Maxwell Atoms so it's possible that they could be carrying on some threads from this film however the leaked plot says they go back in time to the days of Camelot so I find it very unlikely that they can carry on the sheriff storyline when they're back in time but maybe expect to see a continuation of these specific characterizations of the gang that Atoms used in this film because he is in charge of the next film personally i can't wait it sounds tubular so uh back to the video <laughs> back to the video this is the power where i remind you to like the video it really helps us out unless the video gets seen by more people speaking of max fordums let's talk a little bit more about his involvement in the film i didn't really discuss it in my non-spoiler review so i want to talk a bit more about it here of course he was the creator of billy and mandy and it's one of the first times he's worked on a scooby-doo project he was the, both the writer and director of this film so it does feel like this film is sort of his vision it was his baby i'm not entirely sure if he was the one behind the whole sheriff plot and he asked for his inclusion in the previous two films to help set things up or whether that was something that had already been set up and it was a thread he decided to pick up and maybe conclude in this film. I'm not too sure on the specifics of that but I do know one of the things he said when he was working and writing this film he went back and he binged most of the Scooby-Doo franchise and he was able to cherry pick different elements from his favourite shows which I do think is one of a great way to go about making a Scooby-Doo piece of media. You go back and you take a look and you see what works and you put it all together and you create a film that has some of the best elements from different areas of the franchise because you know when you have a franchise as rich as Scooby-Doo you don't need to go back to basics you don't need to go back to the start and reinvent the wheel you can create something fun and something that feels new if you take different elements from different areas you can clearly see he had a love of a pup named Scooby-Doo with a lot of the references that are in this film however at the same time he sets this film in Crystal Cove as opposed to Coolsville I think it was just a town name and a setting that just felt more at home within this film you know you do still see the Crystal Cove, the hauntedest town on Earth sign that was in Mystery Incorporated. I just think it was probably overall a better, more slightly serious setting for the film. Coolsville's a fine name, but it feels incredibly cartoony. Crystal Cove feels like it could be a town that the gang do live in. I did enjoy seeing how he took the idea of guest stars, which had been previously in the new Scooby-Doo movies, in some various films over the years, and in the current Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, and he decided to make Elvira and Bill Nye basically main characters in this film. I liked how they acknowledged that they already met Bill Nye as they had done in an episode of Scooby-Doo and Guess Who but then I also feel like he was a big fan of Be Cool Scooby-Doo. I do feel like that show has things that are similar to his writing style if you look at Billy and Mandy. Two of the main things I think he took from that show were the personalities of both Velma and Daphne. Now Velma isn't hugely different in Be Cool Scooby-Doo but I do think there is a noticeable difference particularly in the way that Kate Micucci voices Velma in that series. Kate Micucci of course did take over as the voice of Velma uh, when working on Be Cool Scooby-Doo but she has also since voiced her in many of the director video movies and it is only subtle but her Be Cool Scooby-Doo version of Velma does have a slightly different type of voice to the voice that she uses in Scooby-Doo and Guess Who and the other Scooby-Doo movies. It just has a bit more of a know-it-all clever clogs vibe to it which definitely fits the characterization of Velma in that show. It's not a major difference and it certainly doesn't sound bad it definitely sounds like Velma but I do think it is noticeable as a slightly different voice to what she would use in other appearances. But the characterization of Velma in Be Cool Scooby-Doo while being notable and distinct isn't drastically different from the traditional depictions of Velma in recent years. It more just has its own twist. The same however cannot be said for Daphne. You know Daphne in Be Cool Scooby-Doo is incredible 
incredibly fun and quirky and she almost has a different thing that she tries out in different episodes. As such I find my enjoyment with this version of Daphne can vary depending on episode to episode, depending on what quirk they decide to give her that week. She can range from being fun and enjoyable to just downright annoying in certain episodes. I do think this film does pick up on these zany aspects of that character but I do think it was in, it was in the sort of fun, enjoyable way. I definitely liked her role in this film. There was only one or two lines where I do think maybe they took it slightly too far, but it certainly never reached the level of hand puppet annoyance as it did in certain episodes of Be Cool Scooby-Doo. I did think it was interesting to see Daphne have a slightly larger role because of this characterization in this film. Since this film is following on from Curse of the 13th Ghost and Return to Zombie Island, it's odd that she seems to be acting completely different to how she acted in those films due to the fact that they chose the Be Cool Scooby-Doo characterization of her. Now the Be Cool characterization of Daphne, I don't hate it, but it certainly isn't my favourite version of Daphne. Yeah, it's one of those things when they were making Be Cool Scooby-Doo, the creators of that show decided to disregard everything apart from the original series, which is certainly something I wasn't overly keen on. I think it's something that's certainly understandable when you're dealing with a big franchise like Scooby-Doo that has so many years of history. However, I don't feel like Scooby-Doo has ever been something that's worried about being weighed down by continuity. This isn't the Marvel or DC universe where they constantly are have to decide what is and what wasn't in continuity. Scooby-Doo's always been a franchise that cherry picks what it's like from previous versions. If you want to say the gang have never met real monsters, fine. If you want to pretend Scrappy-Doo didn't exist, go for it. If you don't want to have to deal with the fact that Fred and Daphne have previously been engaged, all right, ignore it. But I do think it's slightly more annoying and a little bit more like hard to forgive when they just disregard a character's personality. You know one of the problems when you disregard a lot of the modern stuff from Scooby-Doo and just go back to the original is that Fred, Daphne and Velma didn't have much of a personality in the original series. They certainly have an archetype that you can build a personality around. You know with Fred being the leader and the jock type character and Velma being the know-it-all nerd. But Daphne's characterization in the original show was sort of the damsel in distress. Actually I shouldn't have said that, she's not a damsel in distress, that's not fair. She very rarely got kidnapped, danger from Daphne was because she was clumsy, not being kidnapped a lot. I feel like Scooby got kidnapped just as much as she did, but she was sort of portrayed as more of the generic pretty girl, which isn't really a trope that plays well to a modern audience. And so they had to find a way to just completely reinvent the character of Daphne. But the problem is that's been done before multiple times. You know, her character was actually rewritten almost in the 80s as the character was pushed into the center of the show and she was given a more leadership role. She was always very inquisitive. She had a woman's intuition, very resourceful and was made so that she could stand up to herself as well as focusing sometimes on her crush on Fred. The modern version of Daphne is fairly well-rounded and maybe more so than Fred and Velma who largely seem to have stayed within their nerdy and drock tropes. There's been a lot that's been done with Daphne over the years and to disregard all of that just because you only wanted to rewatch the original series can sometimes feel like a shame and I think that's why a lot of people are so resistant towards the Be Cool Scooby-Doo version of Daphne. She's not a bad character she just doesn't feel like Daphne and the inclusion of this version of Daphne in this film was definitely something that made me stop and go oh what at first but I do definitely think that it was this version of Daphne at her best and not at her more annoying. Max Adams definitely pulled things from like so many different areas of Scooby-Doo. Of course just the inclusion of Scarecrow is acknowledging that the Scooby gang live in the same world as Batman. As much as I'm complaining about this new version of Daphne I do think she really worked well in this film and I did find her really fun and entertaining. I just felt like I wanted to express my opinions on just the idea of there being a new version of Daphne as I never felt like there needed to be. Over Overall, I really, really like this film. In fact, I think it's quickly becoming one of my favourite Scooby films. I think it's definitely put itself in the top 10 already. And it's definitely going to be a Halloween staple that I definitely want to watch every year. But I'm probably going to enjoy re-watching this many times more. You know, after the somewhat disappointment of Curse of the 13th Ghost and Return to Zombie Island, it's great to see that these direct-to-video films are back on form. You know, this isn't just a good one. This is a really great one that I definitely am going to re-watch a few times. I don't really have any more spoilery thoughts to say there was a few things there was a few jokes at the end 
like a, a fun little reveal with Elvira and her wig but there's not really much to talk about there it was just a fun joke all right guys thanks for watching if you like this video please give it a like and if you've not done so hit that subscribe button ring that notification bell to be notified the next time a video is out if you haven't already seen my non-spoiler review of this movie go check that one out and if you want more halloween scooby-doo themed videos i recently did a myth behind the monsters halloween special where i took a look at dracula frankenstein's monster and the wolfman all right guys thanks for watching cheers thanks for watching tube of tunes if you want more from the channel hit subscribe if you want to keep up to date with what's going on follow us on our socials hope you liked it cheers